Hi, I'm Tony Russo, and this is Funeral Service Insider from Kate's Boylston. Each episode features conversations about emerging trends and news that affect the death care industry. We talk to people who understand the delicate balance of change in a profession and vocation steeped in tradition. This week, we're speaking with University of Cincinnati professor of social work, Jennifer Wright Berryman. She's actually been on the show before talking about um, LGBTQIA plus issues. And one of the things that she's been doing as part of her research is trying to figure out how funeral homes can signal to the LGBTQIA plus community that they are open to working with them because many aren't. And she has produced a website called EqualDeathCare.org, and we're here to talk about that and why she did it and what she's discovered since finishing her first batch of research on LGBTQIA plus issues in the death care community. Really engaging speaker, really engaging guest. You're going to love this show. Before we get started, I just want to remind you to please subscribe wherever you're listening now. If you're on Apple, just hit the follow button. And that way your phone will notify you when we have a new show. And make sure, please, to stay after for the postmortem this week in postmortem news. We've got a case of mistaken identity again, and I want to say something about it. So we will catch you on the other side. But for right now, here's Jennifer Wright Barriman. So I interviewed you a little bit more than a year ago. I think you were one of the earliest guests on the show, and you talked about how you got involved in death care generally as an academic um, who is not, you know, you weren't raised in a funeral home or anything. So can you just bring everybody up to speed real quick about about your initial research and how that drew you into the funeral service? Absolutely. And I can't believe it's been a year. Yeah, it's crazy. Time flies. Time flies. I have been a mental health and suicide prevention researcher for many, many years. And I was at a conference where folks were talking about death education. So as suicidologists, which is a essentially a researcher who studies suicide and ways to prevent it, I don't think we know enough about death care. And it just sort of lit a spark in me to start studying death care in the United States specifically. And as I was reading research and books and checking out websites and looking to see sort of who were the experts in the area of death care in the United States, I realized there really wasn't a lot of work being done in terms of LGBTQIA voices So I started randomly just visiting funeral home websites looking for, oh, who serves this population specifically? Like if I'm a a member of the LGBTQ community and I was looking to maybe pre-plan my funeral or if I was looking at what my options are, if I was looking for a provider in my area or another area where I could find someone who, who would accept me, a provider who would accept me and I could walk right in their door. And therefore, I would look for something on their website to kind of signal to me that that was a provider that was inclusive. Who would that be? So I started just kind of Googling around and sort of looking around and I couldn't find anything. And I said, this is really interesting to me. And it started to formulate a research question in my mind of, are there disparities, you know, there are disparities in healthcare between the LGBTQIA population and healthcare providers, are there similar disparities between death care providers and the LGBTQ population? So uh, I started looking more deeply into that, and it led me down this path, which now is going on its fifth year. So I've been sort of studying this in various ways. I recently wrapped up a three-year research study that first looked at why our websites for funeral homes are the way they are. Are there reasons why, you know, we don't necessarily see a lot of inclusive language or graphics or or signaling? And then I started to look at policy and I evaluated policies in terms of anti-discrimination policies and how policy and law relate to operating a funeral home or death care in general. Mm-hmm. And then the third part of that sort of research series was I interviewed people involved in death care throughout the entire spectrum of death care. So it could be someone in the medical 
you know, sort of palliative care or hospice care profession, whether they be a nurse or a a physician, all the way through, you know, I interviewed embalmers, I interviewed funeral directors, funeral homeowners, celebrants, pastors, preachers, you name it. I interviewed folks from all over the United States to sort of ask this overarching question, what are the barriers between the LGBTQ community and, you know, death care? And so that paper, that final paper is under review with an academic journal. That's kind of the high level journey story to where I am now. In the meantime, you also got involved in the actual lives of people who are who are dealing with this. This wasn't purely academic. This was something that became part of your life and something that you personally had a connection with. You felt like this was something you should do as a as a person, not just as an not not also, not merely, I don't mean merely, I mean only as an academic. No, you're absolutely right. Well, my, so my PhD is in social work. So I'm a social worker and the heart of social work is not just to study or observe, observe a phenomenon, but also to take part in making change and, and activating change. And so as you and I have discussed, whether it be in podcasts or interviews, the funeral industry can be slow to change. And that doesn't deter me. What that means to me is that to build bridges, we have to find common ground. So yeah, as as the heart of a social worker, this became mission for me, much more mission oriented. And so toward that end, I've developed, I, I call it a program, but we're not an organization yet. So um, <laughs> some colleagues of mine and collaborators who I've met along the way, specifically Kat Vansel Coleman, who is in the funeral profession in New York State, in Rochester, we have built this program called Equal Death Care, and that has a website, and we are actively working on building these bridges between death care providers and the LGBTQ community that way. And we're also, we also have a presence in social media. It's pretty new. We just started this in June. So, yeah. Right. And one of the reasons, I mean, and I, 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 when we spoke about it, I said the second you launch this, let's let's do a podcast about it to kind of get the word out. So, how did you how did you decide that you wanted to kind of put together this program? Because this is something that again you're just you're just doing on your own. So, what did you think the important aspects of it were, and how did you how did you lay out like you're all right? We're going to start with this, and we're going to end with this kind of plan. Yeah, I think it goes all the way back to that very first you know, me sitting at my laptop saying, okay, if I was a member of the LGBTQ community and I was trying to find an inclusive funeral or death care provider, how would I find them? If I use all these keywords and I can't find anything to pop up, what am I supposed to do? And so when I started talking to folks in the LGBTQ community, they said, oh, maybe we'll just ask around and see who knows who. Word of mouth is a really, it can be very reliable and unreliable way to find services. <laughs> you know, I also think about people who live in rural communities. I think about people who don't have access to a lot of services, not just death care services, in terms of those services being explicitly inclusive. I started to formulate this idea in my head about how, it, initially, my idea was just to build like a database, Right. To to, right. build, to to find these funeral providers, these death care providers who were explicitly inclusive, build a database, advertise it, and people could search for their state. And then I thought, you know what? There's a lot more to it. There are resources out there. There are, you know, there's just all kinds of information and education that people need in death care because people don't want to think about it. And I always tell people, Thinking about your death care doesn't have to equate to thinking about your death. You just want to think about how you want your legacy to to look, you how you want it to feel for the loved ones you leave behind, you know, those sorts of things. So I decided that a website made a heck of a lot more sense. It could be interactive. It could be ways for people to also sort of tell their stories uh, about how they found an inclusive provider. So it evolved over time. And as I started meeting people around the country who were involved in this work as well, T. Rogers from uh, Florida, you know, Kat Vansel Coleman, who was from Ohio, who's now in New York, Tim McLoon, who you've talked to several, 
you know, several, mm-hmm. on several occasions. Actually, if I can interrupt you for one moment, um, Kat was actually featured in American Funeral Director last year. She yes. was a, one of our ones to watch, an up and coming um, funeral director that we kind of put a put a pin in. So when she's famous, we can say, yeah, we picked that early on. So well, and you did an excellent job because Kat is phenomenal, and and she, in fact, she and I just met on Monday and had lunch, and we're starting to work on a vetting rubric for providers so that we can vet them, you know, for our website if they aren't explicit, you know, if they don't seem to be explicit. Plug for Kat, you know, (laughs) you may want to circle back with her for an interview because uh, she is just was recently back in Ohio from New York to to do some presentations with her work in trans death care equality. So yes, you you all did an excellent job in picking her as someone to highlight. Uh, She's absolutely wonderful. So it evolved over time and it continues to evolve. So we're continuing to work on how to best highlight those providers. We want to do sort of a provider spotlight on the website so that those who are inclusive and who have found success and have stories uh, related to providing those Unique services for unique individuals can, t- you know, can kind of tell their stories on the website. We've we've discussed it before, but I, I want to be very clear. Can you talk to me about what it means to be explicitly inclusive instead of regular inclusive? Right, implicitly inclusive. <laughs> so, so someone who is implicitly inclusive, and when you and I met this June at a conference that your organization put on, that Kate Spoilston put on, I met a lot of people who are implicitly inclusive. In other words, they're like, oh yeah, we're open to LGBTQ folks walking through our doors. We'll serve, we'll serve anyone. You know, we want to hear what their needs are and we want to create a unique experience for them based, you know, aligned with their identity or aligned with their relationship. And I said, but how do they know? How do the LGBTQ folks know that you are someone who they can walk right into your funeral home or right into your business and feel safe and feel like they can sit down with you and say, this is my life story. This is my same sex spouse, or I'm a trans person or what have you. And, and know that they're going to be welcomed. And they were sort of scratching their heads. And you, Tony, probably know who I'm talking about. Um, (laughs) There was one particular funeral provider there, an absolutely wonderful human being. I really enjoyed talking with this person. But they kind of scratched their head and said, I never thought that I would need to put something on my funeral home website that signaled, whether it be a little pride flag or whether it be a a graphic of a same-sex couple holding hands or, you know, what have you, they, they'd never really given much thought to the fact that, that by not signaling could mean that someone may not walk in your front door because they're afraid they they fear discrimination. They feel fear, you know, especially when we're talking about providers, even though, you know, we were in Rhode Island and that's in, you know, that's sort of in a North and people tend to associate the North or the East Coast with more progressive values. Um, you know, funeral providers in other states that may not be viewed that way would especially probably want to make that signaling clear because folks don't know, you know, and we see pride flags hanging outside of businesses sometimes, or we'll see marketing or advertising commercials or what have you, you, you know, all the, you know, beer, beer commercials or whatever, right. you know, now Bud Light's all in trouble you know, because they align with, you know, during Pride Month, you know. So so that's the difference between being sort of impl- implicitly inclusive and explicitly inclusive. I want to also add that the reason it's important is because discrimination isn't necessarily subtle. Like my my daughter, I was telling I was telling her about this and she lives in Washington. She lives in a college town in Washington. She says, oh, yeah, there is a funeral home in town that everyone knows if you go there and you're gay, they will just send you out. And mm-hmm. that is just something. It's something that, that seems very particular to uh, like the, the sexual minorities in general. And it's still OK to be explicitly discriminatory, which is why I think it's important to be explicitly inclusive. That's 100 percent. And the thing is, is we don't have federal protections. So the LGBTQ community, we do not have a, a federal level equality law passed. States do, but there, therein still lies the problem because even in the state of Colorado, you have wedding planners who discriminate against gay couples. 
they do not, they refuse to make cakes. They refuse to build wedding websites. And so when you talk about funeral providers who are privately owned funeral homes, they can sort of make their own rules. They can claim religious exemptions if there's backlash and that can win in court. We've seen it many times. Conversely, the Supreme Court will tell a funeral home, you can't actually fire someone though (laughs) (laughs) because of Bostock versus Clayton County and Amy Stevens versus R&R. You know, the the, folks are probably pretty familiar with those court (laughs) cases. Um, R&R and RGA, I'm trying to remember the Detroit funeral home, but folks know that case. So, uh, but on the consumer side, People who want who, who are at pre need or who want to prearrange their funeral care, if they just randomly Google transgender funeral home keywords, they could find that case and be like, oh my gosh, there's that's a Supreme Court case that took years to to get to, and that's just on the employment side. So you know, unfortunately, there's enough damning evidence uh, out there on the internet that funeral homes, you know, it would be in their best interest to take explicit marketing tools. It doesn't have to be, you know, you don't have to put a pride flag outside your funeral home, quite frankly, if you put something on your website or on your social media or both, ideally, you know, that's a start. Um, And some funeral homes have started to do that. I get on Google every couple of months and just start putting in keywords to see if I find new funeral homes. And in the last six months, I've found a few more. Most of them have been in New York and New Jersey and California, <laughs> but but at the same time, I, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that we're moving in the right direction. Well, because there are gay and trans folks in small Oklahoma towns and small Iowa towns, and they don't really have you know the same kind of you need to tell them more i think that they're that that they're welcome before they're they're going to have the the wherewithal to step into your funeral home 100% and they have money to spend just like everybody else right i mean <laughs> more they have more <laughs> money to spend I, if i could have signed up for it i would i would be you know i would be a, a, a gay dude living very 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 wealthfully yeah so. <laughs> if you know what, that's exactly right if you have two 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 male incomes you know that's often you're you're in the higher higher uh yeah. Bracket, tax bracket. There. <laughs> no, that's absolutely right. I mean, we have uh, 1.6 million trans folks, uh, trans identifying folks in this country. And we have five times that folks, you know, who have same sex attractions or are in same sex relationships. And so, you know, there are a lot of folks out there mm. uh, with with money to spend. And at the end of the day, Providing funerals is a mission and a business. And I learned a lot being at the conference that you all put on some of the the, the inside concerns about the the things that are going on in the funeral business and how to really, you know, so this is also a marketing strategy, right? Mm. So being inclusive needs to be at the core of your heart. I'm not saying to, to market to folks in the LGBTQ Q community just for business purposes. That's not my mission. My mission is for providers who are already inclusive to explicitly market that. And people who have a goal of being inclusive, who want to learn more, who want to incorporate these values and this ethos into their business, that we provide support for them too. We're not just, our, our equal death care program is intended to provide support both for consumers finding providers, but also for providers who are inclusive, being explicit, but also who want to embrace this ideal of truly serving all people, regardless of sex, sexuality, gender, may just not know enough or may, you know, may be ignorant about what it takes. We really wanna support both sides of this. We're going to speak with Tyler Anderson, the Vice President of Business Development at Procoa, who's one of the many presenters at the upcoming Kate Spoilston Funeral Innovations Conference, slated for November 12th and 13th in Houston, Texas. We were looking at this study from Accenture. It was really interesting. 88% of executives across multiple industries say that consumers are changing faster than their businesses can keep up. It's a really stark statistic because almost 90%, so almost nine out of 10 executives say consumers are changing faster than their business can keep up. I don't know if 90% of funeral homeowners would agree with that sentiment or not, but I know a number of them do. I talk to a lot of funeral homeowners across the country and a lot of those conversations are centered around how do we meet the 
ever evolving and ever changing needs of the consumer. There's a number of things that we're going to look at that are the contributors to that. Um, one that is often overlooked right now is that Gen X is expected to outnumber boomers by 2028. Um, Gen X are a group of people who have been using the internet, internet for most of their lives and expect more from digital experiences than the generation before them. Of course, that's only going to continue to increase as you get to millennials and Gen Z, et cetera. As I said, Tyler is one of the many speakers that we will have at our Advances in Funeral Innovations Conference, November 12th and 13th in Houston, Texas. Link in the show notes. You were talking about creating a rubric. Are there are there things that funeral directors, if they were interested, could find on the website, like tips and tricks? And Yeah, that is coming. So as I mentioned to you, Kat Vansel Coleman and I sat down to firm that up. That is in its final drafts. So uh, essentially, the core components of our rubric is, you know, what does your website look like? What do your human resources look like? Um, one thing that we know is that there are a ton of LGBTQ folks that work in the funeral profession. So knowing what their work life looks like is is helpful in understanding the inclusivity of the funeral home. If these folks are out because they want to be out at work and they feel comfortable being out at work, that's the kind of work culture that we're looking for for an, with an inclusive provider. You know, do they have experience working already providing funeral services or death care services for the LGBTQ community? Finally, we're also looking at community engagement. Does your funeral home, for example, provide education, resources, and information to your local LGBTQ community? You know, do you offer to speak at maybe meetings or, you know, are you a member of the Pride Chamber of Commerce? Sort of, those are just a few things that are included in the rubric. And the rubric is not meant to deter anyone from becoming inclusive. We imagine that of all of those domains and all of those opportunities for folks to demonstrate their inclusivity, that funeral homes aren't going to meet all those. We understand that. Our idea is to present what an ideal picture looks like, but that, you know, it's it's an evolution, you know. This mm-hmm. this can be a journey for a funeral home. A lot of funeral homeowners own several, and right. they don't, they're not all the same. So, like, Cat works for newcomers, and they own funeral homes all over, you know, like the United States. Right. We know that one newcomer's funeral home may be different than the other, and that even if they have a corporate sort of ethos of inclusivity that each individual funeral home may be on its own journey journey toward that. The idea here is that we want to partner, we want to collaborate and work with providers on their inclusive journey. You you said that you were doing searches. Do you think that it's valuable for funeral homes to have uh, to have keyworded entries just like this is how we take care of some people, that kind of thing? Yeah, so search engine optimization, right? Right. Um, <laughs> What I have learned in these years is that the website isn't the first thing that funeral home owners and operators think about. Yeah, no. (laughs) So um, that's still catching up. What I think is happening, though, is this emerging younger group of the family ownership is devolving, is my understanding. Fewer and fewer um, children of funeral home owners and operators are going into the or staying in or going into the business themselves. So this new sort of cohort of mortuary science students that are sort of coming up are going to be savvy with technology. They're going to be savvy with their sort of values and visions around who their customers can be and who their customers are. So I think we're seeing going to see a sea change with websites with technology. And I wouldn't be surprised if some of that happens just sort of organically as new folks start coming up the ranks. However, (laughs) currently (laughs) it's still kind of stuck. So, you know, there are small changes that they can do just to kind of help things along. But as far as search engine optimization, I don't know that I see that as a priority. We we could hold our breath on that, Tony, but I'm not sure. (laughs) 
<laughs> that's gonna the next generation of websites. I think so. I think yeah. so. Yeah. And so you have uh, you have an interactive directory on the website. Yes. Uh, would, would you like to talk to me about that? Yes. I felt like the most intuitive way for folks to find providers was just to be able to click on their state. So we have sort of a map of the United States, and you can click on your state, for example, Ohio, and there will be a list that will pop up. And just to be very transparent with your listeners, our lists of resources don't just include funeral providers. Um, they're going to include anything related to death care that is inclusive. Right now, it's still we're still building. So mm -hmm. if you have a listener that says, oh, I'm going to go visit, you know, equaldeathcare.org and I'm going to pop, you know, look at my state and, and I know I'm inclusive. So I'm going to see if I'm listed there. Um, if you're not listed there, that means that either A, we haven't found you yet and please reach out to us because we would be happy to have a discussion about putting you on the website. Or we did sort of look at your website to sort of do an initial vetting and we didn't see anything or the funeral homes that are listed are like members of the Pride Chamber of Commerce or something like that. So so we we plan on putting an array of resources up. But, you know, again, what we love to do in terms of partnering and collaborating with funeral specific providers is to invite them to be included through this really brief sort of vetting process, which at this time until our rubric is is up and running can be just a conversation or if they're emerging in their inclusivity to just sort of partner with them along the way. But we do want to spotlight if folks are already inclusive and they already have sort of explicit marketing that way, you know, we would love to spotlight those, you know, kind of highlight spotlight those providers on the website. So we, we're going to build a page just to do that, or we'll put them on our front page. Very cool. And I want to give you a chance to say anything else you needed to do, but I do have another question. But before that final question, is there something else that I didn't ask that I should have about equal death care? Something else that you'd like to say that you need people to know that I didn't give you a chance to say? I just want folks to know that while we're asking funeral providers, death care providers to be inclusive, we also on our end want to be inclusive. So if there are folks that listen to your podcast that are members of the LGBTQ community, whether or not they're in the funeral profession or another death care profession. We want to hear from those folks as well, their feedback about what they find on our website. So if they get there and they're like, oh, I wish you had this, or I wish something looked this way. We want feedback from folks you know, on all aspects of this program, we're continuing to build. We want to be true to our mission. And that mission is to serve, you know, we're all consumers of death care eventually. Right. So whether or not we're in the funeral profession, whether or not you're a death doula or you provide compassionate care or end of life care, wherever you are in that space, you know, we, we sort of want to hear from you and get feedback from you. So I'd like to put that out there. Absolutely. And then the other thing I just wanted to mention briefly before we get going is when I first I clicked on Kat to look at her stuff and I re re realized that I recognized her and she was featured in American Funeral Director. And then I clicked on your website, which I had not visited before. And you also do um, fiction, death care fiction, death death fiction? Yeah. I am writing and have written two books in a three book series called Hospice Heroes Mysteries. I was a kid who loved Agatha Christie and, you know, I, I was an avid mystery reader. So when I started studying end of life and death care, I thought, wouldn't it be fun? Well, fun for me <laughs> to, to write uh, a fiction series about a group of people in hospice who solved mysteries in their final months of life. And they have a little spy layer where they meet that's associated with their, it is it is a unique hospice. I will say that I created a unique hospice setting in my book <laughs> uh, because, you know, I've done a lot of work with hospice over the years and I've never seen any spy layers, but that's not to say you couldn't make one right. because 
their their theme, the theme of the Dying Five is the name of the books. And and the theme of the Dying Five is we're not dead yet, let's have an adventure. And so their adventure is to catch criminals and bring them to justice. <laughs> so that's, <laughs> and, and you can find those on Amazon or wherever you buy your books. So thanks for bringing that up. It's, it's a lot of fun, but it's also a way for me to get this message out about death and dying sort of in a, in a way that's a little less gripping than, you know, having to do so through what we would consider sort of thinking about our death is not something people like to do. Putting in a context of a fiction mystery, it could jog somebody's, you know, desire to start thinking about, oh, you know, I never, I don't know what's going to happen to me at the end of my life, but I would like to solve a mystery or I'd like to do something <laughs> different. So that that was kind of what I was what I was going for. Fantastic. And of course, we'll link to all of those things in the show notes. And thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Tony. I appreciate it every time. Funeral Service Insider, the podcast, is a Kate Spoilston production. It was written and edited by me, Tony Russo. I've already said it, but I'll say it again. Make sure you check out the show notes because that's where you can get in touch with us to leave feedback. That's where you can get links to all the things we discussed in the show, particularly the EqualDeathCare.org website. And as always, please subscribe wherever you are listening now. You can follow on Apple. Everything else you can subscribe on. Just hit the little plus button. And when we have an episode come out, you will get it first or at least not last. <laughs> they all come out at the same time. One of the things that we've been doing the last couple of weeks and will continue to do until November is have an occasional bonus episode. Now, if you're a subscriber, subscriber, you've heard a couple of the bonus episodes. We had one with Welton Hong. We have another one this week with Tyler Anderson of Procoa, and we will have them throughout the next month trying to give people a sense of what's going on in Houston, Texas. And what is going on in Houston, Texas is the Advances in Funeral Innovations Conference. Kate Spoilston is bringing experts from all over the country to speak at this conference in Houston, Texas on November 12th and 13th. A link to all of the speakers and the agenda and the registration info in the show notes and I've mentioned this elsewhere and I've mentioned it before, but we do have a special promotional code for podcast listeners. If you would like to come and you would like to save $50, just type FSI podcast in the discount code slot. That is FSI podcast, all caps, all one word, and that will get you $50 off right now. The Registration fee is $197, so you will get it for $147. It will go up. It will go up on October 1st, which is coming up very fast. So if you don't have a chance to register before or you don't get a chance to lock in your travel plans, no problem. The discount code will still work when the price goes to $247. You can still have that $50 off using FSI podcast, all one word all caps. Thank you so much for listening. And now for the postmortem. One of the first outrageous stories I saw when I started as a writer for Kate Spoilston was a story about a family in New Jersey who went to the funeral director and said that the person in the casket wasn't their mother. Rather than check or admit that there could be a mistake, the funeral director said, you're crazy. Dead people just look different when they're dead. And then proceeded to bury the wrong person. I thought that was the worst thing I was going to hear at the time. But this week I was proven wrong by a funeral home in Alabama who said the same thing to two different families. That's right. The first family came in and said, this doesn't look like my grandmother. They said, you're a stupid person. Of course, it's your grandmother. People just look different when they're dead. And then they buried her. And then the next week, another three days later, another family came in and said, this doesn't look like our mother. They said, you're crazy. Dead people just look different when they're dead. And what is particularly outrageous is both of them showed the funeral director a photo of a woman who wasn't in the casket and rather then even begin to consider that he made a mistake. He thought it was better to tell these grieving families that they were stupid. And he was wrong. So, 
you know, this week we had, uh, I'm sorry, as I record, it is September 21st. Coming out this week is a webinar we did from a company called MoreTrack that does body tracking. There is such a thing as body tracking. And if, if you're not going to track the body and someone says, this isn't my loved one, wait a beat you know, figure it out. What was particularly frustrating was the first woman said, are you sure they sent you the right woman from the hospital? Like she was giving the funeral director an out. She was saying, hey, they may have told you this is my mother, but they were wrong. And rather than consider that, he said, no, idiot. People look different when they're dead. And I can't imagine, I I can't imagine how Outrage. There's a, a link in the show notes to the story. The story was a television story, so you can you can see the people, and they're behaving a lot more calmly than I would if someone called me stupid and buried the wrong person in my mother's grave. I I can't imagine. I can't imagine. So if you're not using tracking, use it. If you insist on not using tracking and someone says, hey, this isn't my mother, say, okay, well, maybe it's not. Let me check. Don't say stop being stupid because... It's not just embarrassing for you. It's embarrassing for the entire industry. And you should be ashamed of yourself. Sorry to get so wound up. It just, it just, this story drives me crazy. Any story like that just drives me crazy. If you're going to be arrogant, you have to also always be right. And when you're not, you look even worse than when you're just plain old wrong. And that will do it for this week's episode of Funeral Service Insider, the podcast.